There you go. Okay. Thank you. All right. <laughs> so I'm CT Smith. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, well, actually tonight it's getting kind of late over here in the U.S. Um, but I'm here to give you my method for giving good presentations, like even if you really don't want to. So as a tech writer, you're probably used to being mostly behind the scenes and being able to communicate with your final audience through a written deliverable. You're used to a publication process and you fully understand what's expected of you during each stage of that process. Tech writing is a fun way to communicate with customers and users without actually having to like talk to them much. And this can feel really safe and comfy for many folks, like myself included. And it's a reason a lot of us got into tech writing. Um, we get to have an impact without having to be in front of the customers all the time. So that's why I'm here anyway. Unfortunately, sometimes the best way to deliver your ideas is, uh, to an audience is by actually presenting them verbally, complete with a slide deck and everything. And in some cases, like, if, for example, the only way to appeal to upper management is with a flashy slide deck and a pitch. Sometimes you'll have to give workshops or talks to other teammates. So if, if, if you want to grow your career. Um, so it really makes good sense to invest in your presentation skills. And in this talk, I'm going to help you learn how to treat a presentation like you would any other deliverable with a full publication process so you can confidently convey your ideas. So before I start with my presentation method, I want to give some background on why I started doing things this way. I have never once in my entire life been able to stay on topic in a conversation. I cannot wing anything without going on a rant about an unrelated topic, usually compost toilets. Um, when I was at my first job, I really wanted to grow my career and get promoted. And so I decided to take a course on project leadership. And the problem was it was $5,000. So I asked the company to pay for it. And my manager told me that they'd approve it, but I needed to give a presentation on some of the content. So I don't like presenting. <laughs> I know that I ramble. I had a stutter growing up and speaking in front of people brings me back to being like in fifth grade and having to give a book report to the whole class and getting laughed at. So I spent the whole three months of that course just panicking about how I was going to eventually need to present to like 500 people. And so I kept thinking about how I'm going to manage to give a talk and like not ruin my career or come off as a charlatan. And it, it finally dawned on me that I could use the same method that I use for interview prep. So I was such a poor verbal communicator um, before that before a job interview, I would actually just spend hours driving around in my car practicing interview questions. And I would practice until I felt like I sounded like appropriately confident and not unhinged at all. Um, so I knew I had to give the presentation on project leadership. So I took what I did for the interviews and then I applied it to the presentation. I scripted it and then I practiced the script until it sounded natural and it worked. I did really, really well. Uh, and it became a regular talk that I gave once a quarter for anybody who wanted to show up. At another job, I used this method for every single presentation that I gave. Um, at my one-year review, I explained my method to my manager, and he had no idea that I had scripted everything and never presented off the cuff. Um, he was a gifted speaker, so that was a huge compliment, and it really was what spurred me to kind of dial in the method even more. So now that you know a little bit more about why I came up with my process, I'm going to cover the actual process itself. <laughs> I'm a writer and I prefer never speaking to anyone without the fil filter of the written word and the editing process. I, again, like I have a stutter and I ramble. So it's just easier for me to write. The main thesis for this whole thing is just treat the presentation like a regular deliverable. And you might be thinking, duh, it's obviously a deliverable, but I mean like treat this presentation like any of the other deliverables that you're used to. Use a familiar framework, draft, review, revise, practice, publish, only in this case, publishing is presenting. And the only real difference between a presentation and a new guide that I publish in my documentation is that I have to practice the presentation. This kind of process is familiar to writers and it can really help you ease a lot of the struggle that can come with creating a presentation. Um, just as a note, like the process might seem a little out of order as I explain it, but it still should have familiar elements for you. And in the next few slides, I'm gonna explain like exactly how to actually apply this in real life. So first, I recommend writing a paragraph or so about what your presentation is supposed to be about. 
The way I like to think about this is that the abstract is what's going to show up in the calendar invites meeting description. Or if your talk is a web page, the abstract would be that meta description that shows up in Google search results. If you're at a data shop, it's going to be your short desk. The abstract is, uh, it should tell your audience what to expect. And it's also going to be a way for you to measure your presentation against your goals. So when you're finished writing the presentation, you can go back and make sure that you did everything that your abstract said you would. And then you can adjust if there's a mismatch there. The second step is outlining. So I didn't know this until recently, but apparently outlining is kind of controversial. Um, some people don't do it and then they resent being told to do it. And so it can be, it can be a hot button issue. Um, so I'm just gonna say the outlining step is optional, but I have found that an outline really helps me organize and expand on my thoughts. My outlines never ever serve only one use either. Um, I keep adding them, adding to them until they're a complete document. And this is exactly how I draft long user guides. Um, so the method really translates for me. I usually start with the most basic parts of the presentation and then I keep adding content until I've written the first draft of my script. And by the end of my outline, I will have a clear idea of how many slides I'm gonna need. Let me show you an example of how my outline development works on the next few slides. Version one, let's get meta. This is part of the first version of my outline for this talk. This is just, this is exactly how I started it out. You can see that there's just two points under the intro section there, and I'm gonna expand on those. So this is just how it goes, how it starts. Version two, I start adding more points to the outline, making sure to capture what I think is the most important stuff to cover. Like this should be an old hat for a lot of folks. Like you should know how to outline. Um, you can see here that I've added a few more ideas to each of the main points, and this really helps me give a shape to the kind of content that I do want to discuss. And then finally, I start adding full thoughts to the outline so I can use the outline to scaffold my script. Like I said before, I never let my outline go to waste. It always turns into something else. You may outline things differently, but this is just what I do to stay on topic and make sure that I'm actually covering the most important stuff without having to write a script from scratch. I recommend experimenting with your outline and figuring out what works best for you. And it turns out there are some people who just write a script from nothing and that's okay if that's you. Uh, I don't understand it and my brain doesn't work that way, but you will find whatever works best and feels easiest for you. Okay, now we're on to the exciting stuff. Um, at this point, I take my outline and I start building the slides and the script. I usually make the slides and write the script at the same time. Um, I'll tell you why in a minute. I take my outline and I start with all of my top level headings and I make slide sections from those. Then my second level headings become individual slides. From there, I can decide like if I need more slides or not. Then I take all of the complete thoughts from my outline and I turn those into speaker's notes. I literally copy the outline sections into the speaker note boxes and then just edit from there. That might be a little too chaotic for some people. Um, this is just one of those areas where you're gonna have to figure out what works for you. I do it this way because it helps me keep my slides balanced so I don't spend like 10 minutes on one slide. Um, and the other thing to note is that I don't revise at this point. I have a saying, the first draft is always perfect because all it has to do is exist. This is the first draft of the presentation and I don't do revisions at this point, that comes later. I recommend that you just get all your ideas out and then worry about editing them later. Okay, so this is where things might start getting hard. Uh, <laughs> you need to practice the presentation, dial in the script, and then practice it until it feels natural. Depending on the talk that I'm giving, I may practice a few times or I'll practice twice a day for two weeks. It just depends. For this talk, I actually practiced daily up um, for a few weeks up until a hurricane hit my area and I had to take a week off. And then I practiced three times a day for the three days leading up to tonight. You just want to practice your script until it feels and sounds natural. I'm not a person who can riff on things or improvise without going completely off the rails. If you have ever interacted with me on Write the Doc Slack at all, you know I cannot stay on topic. Um, <laughs> professional derailer. So practicing as much as you need to will help you sound confident and trustworthy, and it can really help calm your nerves, especially if you're the kind of person who gets stage fright. In regards to practicing, I do think that the most impactful tip I have is to practice for time. 
when you're giving a presentation, it's distracting to feel like you don't know how much time you have or to feel like you're going too fast or too slow. And one thing that I've noticed with people that I've coached before is that they really do rush when they haven't practiced for time. So my advice here is to break it down. If you were given an hour for the talking questions, leave ha I like to leave half the time for questions in most cases. Then I'll aim for 26 minutes for the talk itself. And this gives me a four minute buffer for whatever kind of issues and hiccups manifest. For example, I was told 25 minutes is standard for this sort of talk, so I timed mine to be 21 minutes. By the time you give your presentation, you should know basically how much time left you have just by which, uh, how much time you have left just by which slide you're on. So right now I know I'm probably about 10 minutes in and I have about 11 minutes left because I've practiced this for time. As you practice, revise your script and your slides. The first time I run through the whole presentation without stopping, and this gives me an idea of how everything hangs together. This is also the point where I really start regretting my life choices and like try to figure out how to get out of the talk because um, I don't like presenting. So after I make any major adjustments I need after that first run, I will review, uh, I will run through the presentation several times over the course of a few days. I do stop a lot to edit my notes and the slides, and this is totally normal. It is part of the process. And then I just keep doing this until I have fewer and fewer changes and the presentation feels done. Like, I can't tell you how to make sure your presentation feels done. That's something you have to figure out on your own, but like, you'll get to a point where you're like, yeah, ship it. Then you can proofread. <laughs> when you feel like you're done, record yourself running through it and then watch the recording. And this to me is the most awkward part of presenting. Like it's so much worse than actually getting up in front of people. Um, but it's been so useful for me because it's like the final proofread of a doc before you actually ship it. When I watch my recordings, I look out for things like too many filler words, weird sentence constructions, non-inclusive language that kind of snuck in there, weird pauses, hitches, or jarring transitions, mistakes on the slides. Um, I really don't recommend skipping this step. Watching yourself give the presentation can really help you root out any mistakes or areas for improvement. It is really awkward. You can do it by yourself and no one has to know, okay? Give it a try. <laughs> and then finally, present. And so I think for most of this, this is the part that we fear the most, like actually getting up there or getting on camera and presenting. Um, <laughs> I presented, the first time I ever presented anything as an adult, I presented a paper at a philosophy conference and I literally just got up there <laughs> and read my paper like this in front of a room full of people. And then I was so like weirded out by the whole experience that I actually just left and refused. I refused to take any questions and I just left the conference. <laughs> You're not gonna do that. You were gonna have practiced your script until you sound like you were born knowing it. You're gonna make eye contact, you're gonna sound natural and it's gonna feel like a really easy conversation by the time you do present. So one thing I love to do is a final dress rehearsal. Um, that's the day of, and that's just to get you in the right mindset. So I normally schedule that right before the real event. Um, I did one right before I hopped on. Not everyone needs to do this. Um, but I need to, I can't go in cold. I will clam up. So I do need the dress rehearsal. You might be a person that needs one. And finally, relax. <laughs> this is so much easier said than done. But if you have prepared by practicing, give yourself some credit. Like you're capable. You don't need to be a naturally gifted speaker to do a good job. And I am proof of that. All you have to do is be prepared. So Let's talk about some considerations and um, stuff you'll need to keep in mind when working on and delivering a presentation. This one's, this one's my least favorite. <laughs> Sometimes you need to present things that might be unpopular or you may be asking for resources or you're just giving a general talk to a team that you've never really worked with before. These sorts of situations can be fraught and you don't wanna like piss off the people who can approve your project. Um, you also don't wanna demoralize a team that's been going through like a lot of tough changes. So if you can find someone on the inside who can help you navigate potential issues. For example, at a previous job, I needed to give a presentation to a team that had just been acquired and they were very bitter about it. I befriended one of the people on the team and I confided in them that I was like, I was really worried about making people upset and angry because 
my presentation was all about how my my acquisition experience was rocky, but it turned out to be better than I could ever imagine. Um, so I asked this person if they would review my presentation with me just to kind of make sure that my tone and content didn't need adjustments to like accommodate the general morale of that team. So I highly recommend trying to find an ally who knows the situation that you're going into and can help you adjust your messaging. This is really just knowing your audience and it should feel very familiar to you as a writer. So I have a case study. <laughs> I want to give a real example of why paying attention to team morale or politics is important. So I know we all groan about office politics, but they're real and we need to know how to navigate them if we want to be successful. So I brought a new junior writer onto my team back in June. He's very early career. This is his first tech job. And for his onboarding, I asked him to plan a mock integration with our APIs using only our documentation and no help. The point of the project was to use his fresh eyes to kind of root out all the friction points with the docs and the product, and then give a big presentation to the whole company to help folks really understand our developer experience and where we should make improvements. If he had given the first draft of his presentation to the whole company, he would have tanked his career. He had very, very good points, but he came out swinging and he had taken like a tough love posture and it... And his tone was not appropriate for his position in the company, the subject matter, or the current emotional state of the audience. My new writer did not know this, but our teams had recently undergone like a lot of big changes and everybody was, they were still adjusting to them. And the last thing that anyone wanted or needed was a new person that they did not know coming in and telling them how everything they did was wrong and how to fix it. It would have been a disaster. I cannot understate it. It would have permanently damaged the relationship that my team had was, has with engineering. We have a really good relationship. So luckily, as his manager, I was able to intercede and really help guide him into a gentler, more humble presentation. His points were exactly the same, but they were delivered in a way that his audience would be more receptive to. His presentation was wildly successful and he made a name for himself at the company. And now he's super popular and has like exceeded all expectations. So I'm, I'm just saying first, first impressions matter. Okay. If you're coaching direct reports, I've got some stuff for you. If you are coaching people into presenting well, there are a lot of things that you can do to help them. The biggest thing I think is just empower them to put time aside each work day to practice the presentation. Have them treat it like any of their other deliverables and give them time to work on it, especially if it's something high stakes. So if it is something high stakes, like my presentation, my junior writer gave, have them give you the full presentation at least twice. Think of the first one as a rough draft and the second as a proofread. In the example that I just gave you a minute ago, my junior writer was presenting something incredibly important and it contained a lot of critical feedback for other teams. So I made him give me the talk four times. The first time I interrupted him um, with questions and comments a lot, and he made notes. He revised the presentation and he integrated that feedback. The second time I made my own notes while he talked and I, and I paid special attention to his timing and his tone. I interrupted only for really critical stuff or incorrect information and he took my feedback and adjusted again. The third time I didn't interrupt him at all and I just sat and listened to the entire talk for the sort of qualitative feel. And then I gave my feedback when he was finished, kind of like the overall feedback. The fourth time was immediately before the actual presentation, and it was simply a dress rehearsal to get him in the right groove. My junior had never presented anything before, and walking through those steps really helped him dial in the presentation. Like I said, if he had presented his first draft, he would have potentially offended a lot of people with that tone of the presentation. <laughs> so he went in swinging in the first draft, and by the last draft, he was offering gentle, constructive feedback that was received really, really well. Another thing you can do is if you anticipate a lot of hardball questions, go ahead and practice those. Pretend to be the audience. Give your team an opportunity to rehearse answers, um, answers to objections or questions that you expect. Uh, of course, you cannot be prepared for everything, but a little bit of prep here can go a long way. So if, if Jeff in accounting asks the same five really hard questions for every kind of ask, have have answers prepared for that. Let your let your direct report practice those with you. You ask hard questions in the practice so they can prepare. Another tip I have is to give your direct report a warm opening. So hop on the meeting and introduce them and and the talk to the team. It can really help like legitimize them with some audiences. So in my recent case, the teams my direct report was presenting to didn't know him because he was a new hire. 
and I had kept him pretty isolated during his onboarding as part of the, the project. I had to introduce him so people could understand why they were even in the meeting and who this person was talking to them. So as a manager, introducing your team member can really help comfort them, especially if they're a bit nervous. So do whatever you need to do to get them teed up and feel supported so they can really just knock it out of the park. That's all I've got. Um, <laughs> thanks so much for coming. And I hope that something was helpful. And I just want to give sort of a as proof of how well this method works for me. My greater community was flattened by Hurricane Helene a few weeks ago. I'm in I'm in Northeast Tennessee. And I don't know if the news made it to Australia or not, but we've like it, it we really got hammered. Um, and I've been running volunteer operations at my church. So we have an outreach right now. I've had to give two high stakes presentation externally, like to customers at work during all of this. And I did really well on both of them. And it's because I prepared using the method that I just showed you. The practice and present or the practice and preparation can really help you function well under extreme stress, whether the stress is external or just like a product of your own introverted personality or nervousness. So just take heart. You can learn to do well. You can prepare and do well under most circumstances. So. That's awesome. Thank you so much for this. Um, like I said before, I was really looking forward to this because I wish I knew half of this when I started presenting, but I think we've got enough time if people want to, you know, unmute themselves, ask questions. So yeah, thank you again so much. Really good tips. So I think Michael had a question about agenda. Uh, he, he mentioned something about an agenda. I think that was during the slide on outlines. Michael, if you wanted to unmute yourself. Yes, I was just um, uh, just querying if, uh, yeah, agenda was the same, I guess, concept as um, outline. I didn't catch that last word. Sorry, I was just saying, I was just asking if, the, the word or the, the concept of out your outline was the same as an agenda within a within a you know it can be that yeah, I mean that's sure. great I, I feel like my outlines if you if you only took like the first two bullet points of my outlines because I'm telling you my outlines turn into whole this is exactly how I write long user guides I always start with an outline and then I just keep adding sentences until it's a doc you know you fix yeah. the formatting um, so yes, it w it's very similar to an agenda. It, you're, it tells you what you're going to cover. So, <laughs> Thank answer you. your question. Yeah, it does. Yeah, we um, within our um, meeting templates, etc., and um, our you know um, presentation templates, we have you know an agenda, I guess, slide or agenda section. So yeah, it, it marries up to what you're talking about. Yeah, figure out what works for you, though. Like, I'm telling you, it's not hard and fast rule. I'm an outliner. I've always been an outliner type of person. There, My new, my direct report does not outline at all. It drives me crazy, but it works for him, so. Cool, thanks. Do we have any more questions? Please feel free to ask directly. I've got one. Um, just regarding practicing. So this is something I try to do and um, I struggle with watching it back as well. Uh, but I'm just wondering, do you ever ask other people to watch it back and get feedback from someone else? Yes. <laughs> it takes a lot of courage. Um, for example, my husband was sitting across from me when I was rehearsing and I actually made him leave the room because I was <laughs> I'm actually an introvert. Um yeah, sometimes I do. There have been times like I did get a friend to run through. I had them watch this talk that I recorded uh, to get feedback. Some things I don't get feedback. Um, you kind of have to know the person there. I'm trying to figure out how to say this without sounding like I just don't want feedback. Um, some people who don't know the subject matter will offer or don't, aren't your aren't your target audience will offer really bad feedback sometimes. And it can, it can kind of like, it can take the wind out of your sails or make you, make you really start worrying about things. So I would say, yes, have people review it, but make sure that those people kind of align with your target audience a little bit. Um, and definitely with an, like the ally thing that I was talking about, if you were in a 
a fraught political situation at work, absolutely have somebody, if you can get somebody in that target audience to check out your stuff, to make sure you're not going to torpedo your career. <laughs> so. Thank you. Um, Alec, you've got your hand raised. Yeah. So first of all, great talk. Thanks for that. Um, uh, lots of sage advice. Um, so one thing I struggle with is that I do quite a few sort of tutorial type presentations where I'm presenting, you know, half an hour to an hour of quite technical content. And I want, and I, then I you know, want people to take the slides away uh, as reference material. And of course, there's a conflict there in how do you write engaging slides that kind of help you speak uh, as opposed to just walls of text with bullet points that people can read later. Do you, have you come across that problem? What's what's no, I haven't because I am a technical writer. And so I, if you notice, my slides didn't have a ton of text on them. They're very short bullet points my speaker's notes, literally everything that I'm going to say, it's a script. Everything that I'm going to say is in the speaker notes box. And oftentimes when I share my presentations with people, like if it's something that's going to go on internal training, um, I'll include like a video of me giving the talk, but I'll also include the slideshow that includes the speaker's notes because the content, the content of the talk is there. Hmm. Preferably they would watch the talk, but the slides for me are always going to be additive. I am not a person who's going to read slides. Um, I get distracted whenever I, I, there's some people I work with who put like a lot of text on slides and I don't know what's going on. Um, and so I try to keep the slides very light because the slides shouldn't carry the whole presentation and they should not be taken out of context, if that makes sense. But I'm sure that smarter people than me have like opinions on the perfect amount of text on a slide. But this is just what I have found in my experience. And I've given hundreds, if not thousands of presentations at this point. As a very Thank nervous you. person. <laughs> so uh, any other questions? I've, I've just got a quick question myself. So. What's been the, you know, the worst feedback that you've got even after preparations? Like you said, you prepared, you're, you know, you think you're ready. What's the, like, I'm just trying to, you know, use that, see if that, you know, drives us to write better presentations. Or is it just the fact that people sometimes just give feedback for the sake of it? Okay. So I think most of us have a foil at work. <laughs> There's just a person there yeah. that, um, there, <sighs> So I was, I was trying to present on where I was at payably where I just, I've been here almost two years now. Um, I was trying to present on the new direction I was taking the docs into because hmm. we were leaving our old doc vendor. I was completely upending everything. And there is a person that I work with who at the time did not understand content strategy at all. Hmm. And so I asked for feedback from this person and it was a mistake because he's a very technical internal user. And so he wanted everything listed like alphabetically. Mm. And so, you know, like he it didn't follow good information architecture because it made sense for him and only him. And so that is probably the worst feedback I've ever gotten. And it's not that his feedback was bad. His feedback just wasn't useful in the context. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying you really need to make sure you're asking the right people for feedback. You know, like you can ask, you can have somebody who you can run through a presentation to someone who's not in your target audience and they can give you good feedback. Like you said, um, too much. I say now way too much. Like I start every sentence with that at this point. Um, so there, there is some utility, like in having my husband review it and he can say, well, you were, you were wiggling too much. I think maybe you should sit down for this one. Cause I have a tendency to rock back and forth. Um, so some, it, you just have to kind of know who you're asking, I guess, like, and what yeah. kind of feedback you want. But I caution you, if you were presenting something that might be a little bit controversial or painful for people, like I'm changing the information architecture and there's nothing you could do about it, um, to be very selective about who you invite to, because hmm. you don't want anybody to get in your head. You do want feedback, but you don't want somebody who's just going to like shoot you down for no reason yeah, yeah. So be selective that i've i have gotten feedback that i didn't agree with i wouldn't say it was bad feedback i just you know i will i will try harder to not say now every other sentence <laughs> no, that's good 
That's good advice. Thank you. Do we have any more questions? Or comments or feedback? Yeah, I'm open to feedback. Y'all are my tar target audience, so. I think that's pretty much it. That's that's awesome. <laughs> well, I hope it was useful for y'all. I uh, I'm actually an introverted person. I know I come off as very affable a lot of the time, but I don't like talking. <laughs> so... I have one question. Oh yeah, yeah, Sorry. go for it. Yeah, now go for it. Just, I had one question. Just as a general sort of a, a um, interested in uh, CT, if you've got any uh, thoughts on the, I guess the tech writer industry currently. Um, and I'll put a bit of context behind that. I've been out of work myself for some time um, and I'm having to to uh, go and work driving a forklift because of the lack of tech writing work here in Australia, especially in Sydney. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm guessing there's others out of work as well um, and probably you know people struggling in the US as well. Just interested to know what your thoughts um, and anybody else, if anyone else had any thoughts on that too. I do have one thought. Um, I think that the market is really bad for everybody. And I can't speak for the rest of the world. It is, it is really tight in the U S. Um, I have started seeing more job postings. The problem is I'm in a very, uh, very specific niche. And so nothing, it never slowed down for me because I'm, and I have a very specific skill set. I have seen a lot of people struggle though. And one thing that I think is interesting and I've, I haven't been, conf I haven't confirmed this yet. I haven't been able to actually like really confirm it, but whenever the generative AI stuff started to take off late last year, I think a lot of companies jumped the gun thinking we can get rid of our, we, more, we can cut down on our support staff, writers, they don't do anything. Um, we can get rid of them, replace them with AI. And I think some people really jumped the gun on either not hiring writers or thinking that AI could take care of it. And I think that we're going to see a correction there because I don't know if you've ever read AI generated content. Um, it sometimes causes more problems than it fixes. So I, I mean, I, the market's really bad here too. I just, it, I think the whole economy has just been kind of iffy for a few years. We got all, we we got too excited in 2021 when the job market was just everybody was throwing cash everywhere. And it was like, you know, you get four interviews and three offers the same day. So I think things are just different now. It's it's hard. It's really hard. And I'm I'm hoping that everybody is able to find employment and that I am starting to see more job openings, though, which is cool. That's my yeah, totally interesting. unqualified opinion. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah, thanks for that. But I liked your presentation. You had some good points there. Thank you. Yeah, just on that, I, I hardly I do agree with um, CD that it is a little bit tough right now. Like even in Australia, not that I'm on actively looking, but a lot of people reach out with the with the community aspect, saying you know we're looking for jobs or we we're trying to hire, but it's all been one way. Like a lot of people actually looking actively for jobs, but not a lot of people actually reaching out saying, "Hey, we've got some opportunities coming up. Do you know anyone in your network who can help?" So. Hang in there, mate. It's it's. I know it's opening up, like CT said. The um, U.S. market definitely seems to be more active right now, but I think that'll trickle down to Australia start of the new year. Hoping so, because I've been looking at signs that by the start of new year, we'll like you said, uh, CT with the the initial hype of AI dying down a little bit. People are trying to now get professionals back into work. Like, oh no, my content's terrible. What do I do? <laughs> yeah. Can I just um, say how much this talk has resonated with me? I actually um, couldn't learn to read because I had a speech problem. And so I was a kid that was being pointed at at school because I it was just impossible. And it was only through speech therapists that I could actually learn the skills that would enable me to read. And consequently, because of that, you know, dire um, start, um, public talking has been an absolute panic. I just want to add like one technique I found when you get in a panicked anxious state which I do when speaking um, you tend not to breathe properly 
and that's the anxiety. So you're doing very shallow breathing. And I, and I found that by the end of her talk, I was like a puffer fish, like I had breathed in, but I'd forgotten about breathing out. <laughs> And, and like I was just like absolutely puffed out. Um, what I have found is standing up for me is absolutely vital. So even if I'm doing a an online presentation, I always have my standing desk up and it's really helped me with dealing with anxiety. Um, so that's just a tip. But I could see it, reson it resonated what you said resonated so much with me and like the practice 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 and the scripting yeah i do that all yeah um it's funny that you mentioned standing up i actually work at a standing desk like all the time um but i have a i i'm one of those people that has to move to think and so i rock like i am constantly like rocking or stemming or something and i i have gotten feedback that it can be very distracting for people on the video and so i am I'm sitting in a chair and I'm very uncomfortable physically, but it kept me more still. And so um, I <laughs> I also tend to get too excitable when I'm standing up because I'm like kind of bouncing around, you know. And so it's interesting that you say that. And again, like this is just an example of people need to figure out what works for them. And so like this is just a, a kind of, you know, guidelines. This is what's worked for me. Um, I've made it work. I, my direct report is very similar to me and has very similar ticks and stuff like that. And so I am coaching him into sitting down when he presents because he go, like is off camera. <laughs> and so like <laughs> you just have to, everybody is so individual. And so you'd find what works, but I hear you on this. I still don't read out loud um, unless under duress. Uh, because that all it takes is being called a slur one time and having everybody in class laugh at you. It can really like hamper your confidence for the rest of your life. I'm obviously over that now because I am willing to go talk to people in a totally different country. Um, <laughs> but it took a lot of work. And I think um, being prepared, is, it's something that you can control. And especially if you're an anxious person, working on like practice makes practice makes passable. Like, I am not a good public speaker. If you ask me to talk about something unscripted, like right now, that's not one of my hyper-focused interest areas, you're going to get a completely incoherent ramble out of me. And so I know that about myself and I can work really hard to adapt. So, but everybody's different. We've getting a few comments in there. There's, there's an art to giving constructive feedback. Um, Alec also pointed out that it's, it's hard for him to give a pre-recorded talk compared to real time. And wow. Michael, yeah. <laughs> Good for you. I wish I were like that. I'm not. You can't, People ask me for off the cuff answers. I'm like the person I have to text my husband when we're arguing. I can't argue in real time. I have to like sit, write it all out. <laughs> So like everybody, that's really cool. I wish I had that skill. Michael's got a really good comment about um, have you mapped this pro the process to a technical writing workflow? Uh, you would like to add this as a task type? Um, not officially, but in the way that in the way that like in the way that I described in the thing where I will draft and then I re how I revise is by practicing. Um, so it, it doesn't map one to one. I do, if I'm giving a talk at work, I do create tickets for myself. So I will make time to work on the presentation. Nice. Because it, if I am doing something for work, it counts towards my workload, right? Yeah. Yep. And so I track that in a ticket. So that's about as that's about as detailed as I get on that. Talks, Talks is code. code. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Cool. Um, if anyone's got any more questions, if not, we can give you 10 minutes back. I know it's pretty late for CT as well. Oh, Felicity is a question, but you have a story about a time when things went wrong, but it turned out okay. Um, yeah, all the time. Uh, sometimes I have, I have gotten up in the, in front of a meeting and just gotten one slide in and been like, you know, I'm having a bad day or whatever. And I've actually just been like, Hey, y'all forgive me. Let me, let me, let me take a, let me take a drink of water. Let me start over. I just, I didn't get started. Right. And some people may think that that is a silly way to do things, but my whole thing is that like, we're all humans. 
and we all have we all have a responsibility to make sure that the people we work with know they're working with humans and it's okay to stop and like i wouldn't want to do that if i were given a ted talk or something but like if you were at work or here if i had gotten off on the wrong foot i'd be like hold on i got i got started off weird let me and i mean it may it may hurt your credibility in some circles but it may increase your credibility your credibility in others so i just it's not it's not the end of the world to be honest with you so yeah you're right and normally people want you to succeed and will support you yes i've absolutely found that i've had i've had so much more support than any one human deserves and i think it's just because i've been willing to be like oh hey i screwed up let me let me try that again so and you know most people out there are kind it's fine so it's not the end of the world if you screw up a presentation you can just say oh excuse me and then try again Yeah, some good comments from. I forget it's morning time over there, and then y'all are all like bright eyed and bushy tail because it's past my bedtime right now. So <laughs> I am a little bit off kilter, <laughs> just to be clear. You're doing fine. Do my best. <laughs> cool. All right. Um, we won't keep you then, CT. Thank you for your time. I know it's pretty late. And thank you everyone for attending. I will get the recording out to everyone once it's uploaded and I'll put it up in YouTube. But thanks everyone for attending. And um, yeah. Thanks y'all. See you later. Thank you. Thanks.